This morning, I have determined that God deserves my best praise, and I'm going to just enjoy his presence, and y'all can watch me or you can join me. This has been a week where I've needed the Lord and he has sustained me. And so I give him glory and honor and praise for being so good to me. All right, church. This morning, we have the task of learning, studying, a specific topic on this morning. We will look at Matthew later on and we will return to our series in Matthew starting uh, uh, next week. But this week we need to talk about a specific office in our church that has been lacking uh, from in an official capacity. The Lord has given to the local church two offices. There are two biblical offices in the local church, the office of elder or pastor and the office of deacon. We clearly have de uh, elders here at the Bridge Church, but yet we have not in an official capacity had the office of deacon. And so it has become the task of the elders and assigned to uh, staff to create a process for us to have deacons here at the Bridge Church. For us to do this well, we thought it would be important to do some teaching on this topic of deacons. And so we're going to look at three different passages this morning. And hopefully by the end of this sermon, you will understand what the role of a deacon is, the requirements of a deacon, the reward of a deacon, and most of all, the representative deacon. So let's begin there. That is our plan. Let's get started. What is a deacon? What is a deacon. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter number six. Acts chapter number six. We want to begin this morning with the role of the deacon. Acts chapter number six is the first passage that we will read from. It reads, now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to the preaching of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, and a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first thing that we see here as we study the role of a deacons in Acts C is we see that there is a problem. There is a problem. The church has been birthed in Acts chapter 2. The church is growing. And then here in Acts 6, there is uh, the, the church begins to experience growth pain. 
And one of the pains or problems experienced in this early burgeoning church is that the Greek-speaking widows in the church felt like they were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And this, this, you have to understand, was a major issue because these widows would have been considered uh, a considerable portion of poorer members in the church. And the good thing is the church in Acts chapter 2, 44 and 45 put together a common fund. So that, the care, so that they could care for the needs of those in the church. And so these widows say, hey, we know that there are resources to provide for us, but there seems to be some favoritism happening here. The, us who speak Greek are not being served properly at the table. And so what we see here is that in this early part of the church, the unity of the church is at stake. It's inevitable that when an organization grows, there will be pain points. There will be a need for greater organization. And so the apostles know that they have to do something about this problem. People are hurting. People are upset then this church could potentially dissolve in some way because Jesus has already told us that a house divided cannot stand. And so there's a problem. The apostles uh, begin to address the problem, but before they specifically get to the problem, let, they, they say, let us make clear what our priority is. Look at the priority in verse 2. And the 12 summoned the full number of disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Look what happens. The text says they summoned the full number of disciples. So they call the first congregational meeting. And in this meeting, they make it clear what should be the priority of the apostles. Their priority is the preaching of the word of God. And to this, they want to give their full attention, the ministry of the word. This is an important point, church, because as the church grows, the, this word ministry will become the primary ministry of elders and pastors. And the elders and pastors' primary task is the ministry of the word. And that word ministry is going to look different from elder to elder. For some, it may look like pulpit ministry that I'm doing right now. For some, it may be leading a small group. For others, it may be counseling. For others, it may be leading a discipleship group. For others, it may be discipling one-to-one. -one. It's going to look different, but the elders are to devote themselves to the ministry of the word. We are to feed the sheep. And we do that with a heavy diet of biblical teaching. But if you're going to be devoted to the ministry of the word, then you must also be devoted to the ministry of prayer. Verse 4 says, the apostles say, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Elders of the church ought to be devoted to prayer and the word. They pray for themselves, for the flock, for the city, for the strain, for the lost, and much more. That's the priority. And the apostles say it is not right. It is unsatisfactory. It is unpleasing to add the ministry of serving tables to the ministry of the word because that will cause them to neglect the ministry of the word. For elders to do anything that would cause them to neglect the ministry of the word is simply unsatisfactory and displeasing. So, then, apostles, what's the plan? Look at verse 3. They say, pick out from among you seven qualified men who we will appoint to this duty. 
this duty. I believe those two words are important. Let me first say before we get into those two words that notice that the apostles are are not saying we won't serve tables because we're too good to serve tables. No, no, no. It's not because they're, they're, they're not too good. It, it, it's not because uh, it's too menial of a task or it's beneath them. They make it clear that this is very important to them. So we're going to put a plan in place to meet this important need. Matter of fact, this acts Six teaches that both elders and deacons are servants. Let me show it to you. First, he says, uh, uh, it's not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word to serve tables. That's what deacons do. They are servants. They, they are literally table servants. That's what the word means in me, uh, uh, means in Greek. But then at the end, they say, we're going to appoint these men to to this duty, but we're going to devote ourselves to the ministry, say ministry, to deaconing the word. Servant, same word, same root word. Both are servants. One is a teaching ministry and one is meaning the practical needs in the congregation so the elders can be devoted to their task. They complement one another. Now he says here, here's the plan. We're going to appoint you to this duty. What duty? The duty of serving tables. That, as I said, that is the definition of a du- deacon, a table waiter, a servant. A deacon is one who serves the needs of a local congregation. That's the duty. But then he says, we're going to serve, we're, uh, we're going to appoint them to this. Duty. Not not any and every duty they want. They're not going to have oversight duties. They're going to be appointed to this duty. A a task-specific role. Why am I bringing this up? Because in many, I have a history of the Baptist church, so I can talk about Baptist churches. In many Baptist churches in the past and even today, deacons serve as a quasi-elder board. Many churches have deacons set up in a way to where they have oversight of the pastor. They believe that the deacon's role is to keep the pastor in check. I'm serious. And that's how many uh, 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 congregational Baptist churches function. The deacons are there to run the church, per se. But notice that when we see this description of the church here in Acts 6, deacons are appointed by somebody above them for a specific duty. This duty. So what we actually see then is another, or, or, or what we can see, not only do deacons unify the church, not only do deacons ser- uh, serve the church, but deacons assist the elders. They assist the elders in implementing the mission, vision, values of the church. Like those in the cabinet of the president serve at the pleasure of the president uh, president in some way, uh, in, in a way, deacons serve at the pleasure of the elders. And so these deacons, I, I believe these men who are uh, selected here in Acts 6 are a prototype of deacons. They are congregationally selected, and it's in the text, and then they are appointed by church leaders to serve. So, a deacon then is a qualified person that serves the local church by assisting the elders in meeting the physical needs of that congregation. A deacon is a qualified person that serves the local church by assisting the elders in meeting the physical needs of that congregation. Let me just say one thing about that definition of a deacon. 
I said it, they, they meet physical needs of that congregation. Uh, being a deacon is not transferable. You, you don't go from the bridge church and then go to first free and, and expect to be a deacon because you were at first free because you were a deacon at the bridge. It's local church specific. Now, we want you to transfer. We want your character to transfer with you. We want that to go with you. We want you to be able to meet the needs, uh, uh, meet the qualifications of whatever a deacon is. But you can't, one can't expect to be a deacon there because they were a deacon here. So we say a deacon is a qualified person. Your question obviously is, what are the qualifications, preacher? So let's move to the requirements for a deacon. And to do that, we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. We'll begin with verse number 8. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse number 8. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified. Not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, just a little. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Lord, have mercy. Y'all are a mess. Not greedy for dishonest gain. <laughs> they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, not sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that it is in Christ Jesus. He says deacons, likewise, must be dignified. And we don't have enough time for me to go on and on on each one of these qualifications, so I just want to give you primarily the meaning and then we'll keep moving. Dignified. That means to be worthy of respect and honor. To be worthy of respect and honor. One who is dignified is pr primarily a person that is self-controlled. That's what we see here in these three negatives following, following the qualification to be dignified. He says they must not be double-tongued. So, so they can't say one thing and mean another. They, can't, they shouldn't say one thing to one person and then go and say another thing about the same thing to another person. The, the, the idea here between not being double-tongued is they must be sincere. Genuine. They won't be gossipers or slanderers. So they must be self-controlled in their speech, but they also must be self-controlled in their appetite. They shouldn't be addicted to substances. That's what he's talking about. He says not addicted to much wine. There should not be any type of addiction. Self-control. And Paul will later say, that to all Christians, that we should not uh, 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 be filled with alcohol or with wine, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see this in Acts 6 for the requirement of a deacon there, that they must be full of the Spirit, under the control of the Spirit. But they also must be self-controlled in their money. Must be also self-controlled in their money. He says they cannot be greedy for dishonest gain. So even in these qualifications, we can kind of get a hint of what deacons actually do when we get down to the practical parts of it. Obviously, there are finances involved. There, there is meeting needs uh, 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 as far as their appetite. Then there's, there is a type of speech ministry as well. Then he says they also must hold to the faith, the mystery of the faith. The faith, they, they must affirm uh, uh, without reservation a, that local church's statement of faith, the basics of the Christian faith. He says, but they also must be tested. 
Why must they be tested? Because what his point is, they don't need to be somebody that just showed up on the scene. They can't be a novice, a person that's new to the faith. They should have some proven track record of faith and godly character and even a desire to serve. He says also, they must be blameless. That does not mean perfect. That means that there should not, there cannot be any credible charges regarding that person's belief and behavior. And then things kind of get sticky, a little muddy and controversial. Verse 11, he says, and their wives. Question. Let me just tell you this. We didn't read this. In chapter, in verses number one through seven, he gives the qualification for an elder, a pastor, an overseer, a bishop. But he does not there in verses one through seven, he says nothing about the wives of elders. Why then would he be speaking now then about the wives of deacons? What's so special about deacons' wives that they actually get mentioned rather than the wives of elders. Because y'all know, even in the church now, we, we have first ladies. <laughs> kind of don't want to be called a first lady because that insinuates that there's a second one. <laughs> I told y'all she cray cray. That's my first question. We've got in translation, we have a translation problem here. Because when I went back and read the Greek text for verse 11, here's what it says. It just says, gynecos. That word, where we get our word gynecology from, means, can be translated women or wives. And so how do you determine which one is one? Context determines which one he means. So he here, he here he could be talking about women, deacons, female deacons, or he could be talking about the wives of deacons. There's another problem, though. There's a problem, our beloved ESV. He says, when they start verse 11, they translate their wives. Problem. What's the problem? The possessive pronoun their is not there in the Greek text. The possessive pronoun there is not, does not exist in the Greek text. It literally just says gunikos or women or wives. So we've got a couple of problems then. So then what in the world is Paul talking about here in verse 11? Who is he addressing? Is he really talking about the wives of, of deacons or is he talking about women deacons? I'm convinced that he's talking about female deacons or deaconesses. Let me show you. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant, deacon of the church, which is at Centria. Paul in Romans chapter 16 affirms that there is a female deacon in a local church because specifically, the deacon role is not a teaching role. I believe it to be open to women as well. And so at the bridge, we will nominate, select, and affirm both male and female deacons. Oh. Yeah, I feel like I can go on now. <laughs> what does he say about he 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 he? Either way, there there are females 
in the church that Paul says you have leadership and influence and I'm going to put some qualifications on you. Why else would he put qualifications on them unless they have some type of leadership capacity in the local church? So what did he say? He said, y'all got to be dignified too. Remember? I said, remember that, Ella? <laughs> be dignified. He says, they must also not be slanderers. Y'all, when I was reading this, I, it was, this blew my mind. I forgot all about this. Do you know that the Greek word in, for slanderers is diabolos, where we get our word diabolical? This is for the whole church, by the way. Slander is diabolical. Keep y'all's mouth off one another. When you slander other people, you are being devilish. He is called diabolical because guess what he does when he goes to heaven? He slanders each and every one of you. Okay, that's it. <laughs> he says you must also be sober-minded. That, 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 that in, entails being self-controlled, again, just like the male deacons. But then he goes back to the male deacons. He says, by the way, you men, you must be a one-woman man. He says the same thing for elders. Be a one-woman man. One-woman man. Now, does that mean one woman only forever? One woman at a time? Or, 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 <laughs> y'all, <laughs> that's not how I meant it. <laughs> Dominic, I told you you should have preached this sermon. <laughs> the issue that we're getting at here is, can a divorced person serve as a deacon? And, I, and that's the same question we have to answer for the elder. And I think that goes back to our message from last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was, when we talked about marriage. That Those things, I think, would have to be investigated by the, uh, the elders, and we would have to determine the, the reasons for the divorce, whether it was biblical or not, if there's been uh, repentance, all those other kinds of things. And so, um, can a divorced person possibly serve as a deacon, maybe. It would require some wisdom and some work on the elders to determine that person fits the qualifications. You know, I, divorce is a big deal, and divorce is something that God hates. That's scripture. God hates divorce. But we've elevated divorce to a, a position in the church where it's like an unforgivable sin. And, and uh, shame on us. Shame on us. All right, let's move on. He says deacons must also manage their household well. If they can't manage their own household well, then they are unqualified and unfit to manage any part of God's household. Same requirements as elders earlier on. Those are the requirements, the qualifications for a deacon, according to Paul. So he moves now from the requirements of deacons to the reward in verse 13. He says, for those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Paul knows that deacon work is demanding. The standards are high. The duties can be difficult. And so he says, I want to encourage you who serve as deacons, that there is a reward. First, he says that it will result in recognition. You will have a good standing for themselves. That word standing means rank or degree or even grade. He says you, you will increase in respect that is needed for effective ministry. God will give you influence in the eyes of those you are to serve. 
He says, not only will you gain recognition, but you will have an insurance, or uh, 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 you will have assurance and confidence in the genuineness and sincerity of your faith. You will have great assurance in your faith that you have truly served the Lord faithfully. Deacons who deacon well can expect to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the reward. But now I want us to look finally at the deacon of deacons. And we see that in Matthew chapter 20. Let's go there. We are going back to Matthew. Matthew chapter number 20, the representative deacon. Not only is he king of kings and lord of lords, but he's also deacon of deacons. Matthew chapter number 20, beginning verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked for him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine, are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. But the ten heard it, <laughs> they were big mad. <laughs> but Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your deacon. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Here it is. Even as the Son of Man came not to be deaconed, but to deacon and to give his life as a ransom for many. Those places where it says servant or serve, same root word for deacon, diakonos. Jesus came not to be deacon but to deacon and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the model deacon. So being a deacon is not beneath anyone in the body of Christ. Jesus deaconed by humbling himself to take on the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of a man. Je Jesus deaconed by, by humbling himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus deaconed by dying. Being a deacon is not just an office. It's the heart of Christ. It's the position and posture of Christ. It's the position that Christ assumed for our good, for our benefit. Jesus deaconed by dying on an old rugged cross. He became a deacon so that you who are dead could have eternal life. The righteous for the unrighteous, the godly for the ungodly, the innocent for the guilty. That's what we see at the cross. So, we must, too, behave like Jesus, become like Jesus, humble ourselves, and serve as Jesus served. And so, for somebody in this church today, the response for you in this sermon on serving, this is not just for a few who will be nominated to be deacons. But this is a lesson for all of us. It requires humility 
to come and serve others for the benefit of the body. To sacrifice one's time, one's skills, one, uh, one's abilities for the sake of the church. That, that deacon served Jesus served by dying on the cross. That, that deacon served so well that he was buried in a grave. But that deacon was so faithful in his service that that same deacon who was humiliated bright Sunday morning was exalted by the Father and was vindicated, rose from the grave. And that deacon now sits at the right hand of the Father. And so for somebody, do you believe in this deacon? That's my question for you. Have you believed, have you put all your trust, all your faith, all your hope, and all of your confidence in Deacon Jesus? Because only through him can you be saved, can you be rescued from the wrath. He has drank the cup of the wrath of God for your sake. And now you respond to that said Deacon by believing in him, putting all your trust in him, by following him faithfully. For others, the response to this sermon is, let's talk about your character as a servant. See, we want to move quickly to the serving part. But there's a lot here. That the deacons are essentially to model the character that God expects of all followers of Christ. Do you have self-control in your speech, in your appetite? Are you not a gossiper or a slanderer? What is your character? When we start talking about a, 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 a fully devoted follower of Christ or a mature follower of Christ, one place that we can look for a picture of maturity is 1 Timothy chapter 3. When we look for the qualifications of elders, qualifications of deacons, we see pictures of mature men and women. But then, yes. A clear response is to serve. And yes, I am going to guilt you a little bit at this moment. Here we go. If Jesus can die on the cross, you can serve in the nursery. I can say that because I get to preach every Sunday, so I ain't got to go over there. <laughs> but if Jesus can die on the cross, you can serve. You can sacrifice your time to serve the body of Christ. How are you serving? How will you serve? And somebody's like, I'm good, Pastor. I serve in four, five ministries and counting. Are you serving faithfully, though? Are you serving with excellence? Or are you giving God just good enough? How will you serve? Worship team, you can come back now. What then does the process for, for having deacons at the Bridge Church look like? I'm grateful to Pastor Dominic. He was tasked with getting this up and running. The deacons had done some pre-work. and We said this is a priority for our church. Our church will be better and more faithful to what a biblical church is if we have deacons. And so when he came on board, he was tasked with coming up with a plan, implementing said plan. And so when you, you can go to our website, there will be some quick reminders and refreshers about what a deacon is, what a deacon do, what the qualifications of a deacon are, but then it will also outline a process for you. And I don't remember all the steps of the process. Here's what I need you to do. One, go look at the website. Two, we need you to start prayerfully considering who you will nominate to be a deacon in our church. There are three roles that we need now, like yesterday. We, have, we are looking for benevolence deacons. These are meeting the, the needs of those who are in need. Some of the things that we do for benevolence are we meet 
Uh, we help people with rent, mortgage, car notes, car insurance, food, clothes, all types of things. And so those needs come into the church. And right now the benevolence team essentially is Emily and I. I am an elder. And the apostle said, it is not right for me to neglect the ministry of the word to serve tables. Not because I'm better, because God has given to his church gifts. My job is to preach the word, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so we need, we're going to be looking for benevolence deacons. And so we need for you to prayerfully consider is that somewhere where you can serve in the church? Do you know others who can serve in the church? And if so, then we would ask for you to nominate them through the website. We, we need finance deacons who deal with the finance, all the different finances outside of meeting the, these needs for those in need. We need finance deacons who deal with counting the money, depositing the money, creating budgets, holding us accountable to the budget, those kinds of things. But then we also need hospitality deacons as well. Is that right? Those are three. Hospitality deacons. To to greet people as they come into this building. To let them know how glad we, we are to have them. You know, the Bible does say, be hospitable to one another. That's a command. So we'll do those things. We need ushers and greeters and all that needs to be organized and scheduled and all those types of things. It's a holistic ministry. You can read all about it, but we want to make these official capacities where the elders know that if there's a problem, there are people we can go to and say, we need your assistance, we need your help so that we can be devoted to the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. There are so many other needs that we have, but those are the ones we're going to start with. And so you need to be prayerfully considering is that a place for you to serve or is there somebody you know who would be great in that capacity? If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me, another elder, Dominic, and we will do our best to answer those questions. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Jesus who didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he did that faithfully by giving his life as a ransom for many. And so now, Father, we pray that if there's somebody in here who is not yet trusting in Jesus for forgiveness of sins, we pray, God, that that, that you, Holy Spirit, will begin to convict them, convince them of their sinfulness and their need for a a rescue from from God's wrath, from deliverance from their sin and sinfulness. And that they will turn to Jesus by trusting in him and him alone. Father, forgive us for not being faithful in our uh, serving. God, make us a church full of servants. In Christ's name, amen.